Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh is the, uh, well, he's a retired physician, also founder of a an international, becoming international uh, organization called Health Watch USA. Good morning, Dr. K. Uh, good morning, Jack. How are you today, sir? Uh, doing really good, really good. Let's talk about uh, vaccines and the fact that some of them may give a lasting immunity, even more so than originally thought. Uh, that's correct. And those are the mRNA vaccines. Now, they elicit a highly specific response of neutralizing antibodies to the spike protein. And the University of Washington at St. Louis, they performed a laboratory study on lymph node tissue and found germinal centers of the type that is seen in patients who develop lasting immunity to infections and vaccines. And so that is really good news. Because, you know, even with these variants, the initial vaccine will still give you at least some protection, even with variants in the future. And right now, of course, it gives you very good protection. And I should add that just this morning, I've been asked about this repeatedly, Johnson & Johnson made a statement that their vaccine does have some efficacy against the Delta variant and that it also gives immunity for at least eight months. Now, I should add that it says it gives adequate protection. Not sure what adequate is. It, it could be really good protection or it could be like going to surgery and you ask your surgeon, are you good at doing this? And he says, well, I'm adequate. So, you know, you really have to see the data yet, but nevertheless, it's going to give you some protection. And so that's good news. It is good news. And what, what is the news in terms of this Delta variant? Well, the Delta variant is increasing in the United States. They say it's at least 25% of cases. We don't really know because in that respect, we're kind of flying blind. We're not doing a lot of community testing. We do have some areas of the country and world that have reenacted the mask mandates. Los Angeles County, for example, has done that. Overall, cases in the United States are increasing. But the scary thing is, if you look at the United Kingdom, and they have over a 62% full vaccination rate in their adult population, the cases in the United Kingdom are spiking. They have reached a level that is as high as the level that was reached there over the Thanksgiving holidays. How do you make that make sense? Well, because it is so infectious, it is seeking out those that have not been vaccinated. It's over twice as infectious. So, you know, if you have half the people vaccinated, a virus that is twice as infectious, then you're going to have the same result. And it is also causing some infections in those individuals that are vaccinated. But the reports I've read stated that they're not getting so severely sick that they're in the hospital. That's good news, but remember about long COVID and all of the new studies coming out showing that probably between 20 and 30 percent of even those individuals not in the hospital can have lasting symptoms from this virus. So, Jack, we need to be careful. I agree with the WHO at this point and not with our CDC that if you're going into a poorly ventilated indoor setting, especially if it's crowded, the safest thing to do, even if you're vaccinated, is to wear a mask and socially distance. And I myself, of course, I'm very high risk for COVID. I have to disclose that. I'm not a, you know, a young chicken anymore. I myself will wear a mask or not go into that venue. Now, I, say, I assume that uh, everybody flying on an airplane has to wear a mask too, right? I think that's still in force. Well, definitely. And that is absolutely imperative because you need to realize when you fly on an airplane, you're really intermingling with people who have just recently intermingled with people that have been out of this nation. In other words, they could be easily bringing in viruses and even variants that are more severe from countries like Africa or India. And so, yes, if you're in a setting that's crowded where you're going to be intermingling with people who are from other nations wearing a mask and doing social distancing is of utmost importance. I myself am kind of perplexed why we don't have more travel bans and restrictions. What in the heck has Singapore done? Well, Singapore takes the virus very seriously. I mean, one to two cases is a major outbreak. They close down. They do cell phone tracking. 
They have had a strategy of elimination. So has Australia, although Singapore, being more of an island type of a nation city, has been able to do that strategy more efficiently. But adjusting for population, we would have less than 2,000 deaths and less than 550 cases per day in the United States. And that's 2,000 deaths in total. And the effectiveness of their strategies is just unbelievable. It suppressed everything. Flu, cold, enterovirus, adenoviruses, COVID, it all went away. So this narrative of, oh, you know, COVID is just the flu and what we're seeing are flu deaths, that's false. Singapore, everything went away with masking, social distancing, and their interventions. And then when they stopped these interventions, several weeks later, some of the viruses came back, such as the adenovirus, rhinoviruses. But flu and several other of the viruses are still at extremely low levels. So they're having a lasting effect there. This is an elimination strategy. That's a strategy I wish that we followed. And they may be ahead of the game. If we see another surge, in our society, that uh, may put us behind Singapore and Australia as far as economic recovery. We'll just have to see what happens. Now, a new study, I understand you can tell us more about this, uh, indicates 27% of non-hospitalized patients complain of long COVID-19. What's, uh, what, what more light can you shed on that? Well, that's a study that is from the FAIR Health Network, and they looked at 1.9 million COVID-19 patient billing records or insurance records. And they found that 50% of hospitalized patients had lasting symptoms. 27.5% of patients who were not in the hospital but were symptomatic had lasting symptoms. But what surprised me was 19% were asymptomatic that also had these symptoms. So 19% of asymptomatic patients had symptoms of long COVID. And they complained of things such as pain, difficulty breathing, fatigue. Of course, you had anxiety, depression, kind of the whole gamut. And this is something that is disturbing. And we are seeing this more and more reported by different studies. And Jack, I tell you, if that doesn't make you take this virus seriously, I don't know what will. The narrative of, oh, I have only one chance in a hundred of dying, so I'm going to go into the restaurant and eat. First of all, I don't like those statistics on the get-go, but there's a lot more problems that can occur with this virus. So again, wear a mask, social distance, and view vaccinations as a shield of armor rather than as a for sure cure. Do we know why some people develop long COVID and others don't? Do we have any idea? No, we don't, Jack. There's a lot of studies on that. One of the studies I recently saw was they thought, well, it was reactivation of the mononucleosis virus. You know, they postulated that. Not, nothing for sure. But there is a lot of variability in how this virus affects people. And that's true with the spread of the disease. People have a hard time grasping why some areas go a long time without a case and then all of a sudden they explode. And the reason is the majority of the cases come from a minority of people. There are certain people that are just super spreaders. They can live with the virus and they shed it like you can't believe. And when a virus finds that type of a host, that's when things can really take off in the community. So there's a huge variation. And that's one of the things that makes medical research, medical advice so hard to give out is that not everybody is the same. And we're back with Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh. Let us go to the phone lines. And Laura is first. Hey, Laura, good morning. Good morning, Jack. Good morning, Doctor. Uh, doctor, I'd like to ask you, do, you, do we need to make some adjustments for statistics from European countries to our our statistics? Because they have public health systems, and people have so much more access to health care. If they feel bad, they go straight to a doctor without thinking about it. And... Of course, we, we can't do that. We have a lot of people running computers for insurance companies, but maybe less doctors and nurses, and we do less testing and things, especially now that so many
many of our older people are vaccinated because I think we rely more on statistics for people going into the hospital with COVID and dying of it. And I think we're going to have less of that, but maybe more spread among the younger and healthier. What do you say, Dr. Am I, am I making sense? Well, yes, all the countries have different healthcare systems for tracking patients, and we have the most underdeveloped system as far as being coordinated and running uniformly in our nation. We have trouble just comparing statistics between states because of that. That's one of the reasons why when you look at death data, at some point we'll be looking at excess deaths. And we've discussed early last year that that's the most reliable way of comparing deaths between countries and the impact of the pandemic. And some of that data is already coming out. Now, the European countries have also targeted the elderly population, similar to the United States, so that they're seeing mainly younger people affected by these new waves and surges, which also accounts for the decrease in deaths. And this could be because the virus is targeting younger people, but it could also be because older people are vaccinated. Older people tend to follow advice and be a bit more careful than younger people who view themselves as being indestructible. So direct comparisons are difficult, but in my opinion, in the United States, we tend to underestimate the impact of this pandemic as opposed to overestimating it. Thank you uh, for your call. We appreciate that very much. Don, thanks for holding. You're on the air. Jack and doc, Dr. Kavanaugh, I wrote that people get vaccines all the time and they get them for their dogs and their cats and their horses or whatever, yet they won't get themselves vaccinated out of some sort of paranoia, and I think it's more joint paranoia than anything. But I knew a woman, and she's still a living woman, that did the introduction of vaccines to the Amish, Mennonites, and Heterites because they were having epidemics. People don't see this, and you're right. The young people are, are some of the super spreaders, though I think. I, I call it from a middle-aged person that would never really admit that they had it and or were spreading it, but they did it to a number of people, not just me. And I want to see people maybe use peer pressure to get some of these young people to do something. I'll cut my kids out of my will if I have to to get them to get their vaccinations, but ironically, they, they have all gotten it, so the ones I'm in touch with. But... Um, I appreciate this talk about this because we need to push and peer pressure, not just to have uh, a medical authority speak for us. All right. Thank you, Don. Uh, any comment for Don? Oh, I agree with that. And there has been outreach to both barbers, religious leaders, community leaders, trying to get people to get vaccinated. I mean, that is just key to do. I can't tell you how frustrating it is because when I hear people calling into this show mitigating the problems of COVID and long COVID, but then get scared of the same problem that occurs maybe a thousand times less with the vaccine, to me, it's just mind boggling why people can't judge risks. And to me, the vaccines are exceedingly safe compared to any vaccine that we've had. And they're a godsend compared to what you're going to be dealing with if you get long COVID. So you need to get vaccinated. That is just key. I can't stress that more. And that includes the young, because a lot of the studies coming out on long COVID is showing that this affects younger people too. That's the main risk. If you remember last year, when everybody thought I was an alarmist, I was talking about myocarditis in the college-age athletes. Well, it was an alarmist. This is what we're up against with this virus, and now people are starting to realize it. The only thing is we need to realize it soon enough so you can get both doses of the vaccine before you get exposed to the Delta variant. All right, here's a couple more texts before we run out of time. Uh, my frustration over the non-vaxxers and CDC continues to grow. The people who are immune deficient continue to have to live under the threat of getting sick through no fault of their own. Some families, especially with young kids, have little choice or say on this issue. Uh, what do you say to this person? Well, definitely, and that's about one in 30 individuals in the United States. 
especially if you have had a transplantation and are on medications to suppress your immunity, you are at high risk for this, even if vaccinated, because there's multiple studies have shown that vaccines are not producing nearly as strong a response, sometimes no antibodies in these individuals. So yes, they are placing everybody at risk. And if we don't get this virus under control, certain aspects of medical care, such as transplantation, chemotherapy for cancer, treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, all of this will be placed in jeopardy. So this is a serious virus. Uh, Dave says, I have a friend that works at the hospital in Lexington. She, she x-rayed 47 people on Wednesday for blood clots in feet and legs after getting the vaccine. Why don't things like this ever make the news? Are you aware of blood clots as a result of the vaccine? Well, yeah, that's been a huge uh, topic, especially for some of the vaccines that we've seen. And we've but had advisories out, but it's rare. 47 people in one day. I mean, that's not rare if that's if that's true. Well, it's maybe, but a lot of people in Kentucky, Jack, have been vaccinated. You need to realize that. If it's UK, it's a major referral medical center for the state. So we really don't know what the denominator is. And remember, blood clots are treatable. COVID-19, for the most part, if you're in the hospital with it, you're in big trouble. You don't have a treatment for that. A couple other people uh, with negative, uh, let's see, pretty nasty stuff coming in here. Can't believe you still have this guy on the air six months uh, after the last time I tuned in. Uh, people just want it to be over with, and it's not. Well, they do. But, you know, Jack, we've been right, and that's the thing. I've been on the air for over a year, and most of my advisements have been right on the money, including yep. the one we gave about the Delta variant, which was far ahead of the CDC's advisement. And I think we were one of the first news outlets in the nation to make that. Now it's all over the news. So we are not following the advisements of the CDC. I think that we are either co-making them or, in some cases, leading them. I appreciate it. I hope you have a great 4th of July. We will talk to you next Friday. All right. Thank you, Jack.